is selecting your indicators. So, the, you know, the, the very first question we need to ask is, um, how are we going to know? What are the, the measures we're going to use to track progress on the results of our project? When I use the word indicator, just to make sure we're all on the same page there, an indicator is simply a means of measuring progress on outcomes and outputs. So it's a way that you're going to track what has happened and how it has impacted people. Indicators can be qualitative or quantitative, so they can be numbers or they could be words and information that you've received from people. Um, and it's usually structured as a unit of measure, a unit of analysis, and a context. So it might be um, a change for uh, of a certain kind for certain people in a certain place. So it's going to be very specific, um, but it's going to be linked to your expected results. So if you're using the project builder tool or if you've got a logic model in another uh, tool or another format, that's fine as well. But generally speaking, before you can develop your monitoring and evaluation plan, you do need to have a very clear picture of what it is you're trying to achieve, what your hypothesis or theory of change is for the project you're implementing. So if you've got a logic model, you've got that mapped out. You've got very clear outcome statements and output statements about what the impact is going to be at each level um, and over time as you implement your project. So your monitoring and evaluation plan should start by listing all of those uh, outcomes that you are trying to achieve through your work. Um, and you're going to develop at least one indicator generally for each of those outcomes. So if you are using the Excel-based project builder tool, your outcomes that you've developed for your logic model will automatically pre-populate the, the uh, monitoring and evaluation tab in the project builder. So here's an example. If you look on this side, on the left side of the screen here, uh, you see the logic model, and this is just a very simple example of a project impacting farmers. And if once those uh, outcomes and at the intermediate, immediate, and output level are in, inputted into the logic model, they've automatically populated over here for the monitoring and evaluation plan. So we're ready to go and start thinking about indicators uh, against those outcomes. So as you're looking at your expected results, what are the questions you need to ask or think through in order to develop effective indicators? Some of the considerations are, does the indicator that you're looking at directly measure the result? The link between the two should be very clear and obvious, not just to you who, who, are, who are sort of living and breathing this project, but to anyone who would come and look at the plan, they should be able to look at the indicator and see how it is linked to the outcome you're trying to achieve. Does the indicator reflect the perspective of impacted beneficiaries? And you're going to see throughout, I'm going to have these little asterisks where I'm highlighting where there is opportunity to be participatory in your approach and to make sure that you're engaging the perspectives of the communities and individuals that you're trying to reach through your project. I think this is really important um, in order to properly measure the impact of a project is to ask beneficiaries what they would see as a success or how they will be evaluating their own success as a result of the project and seeing how you can integrate their perspectives directly into the plan. Um, can the indicator you're looking at actually be measured? Right? So we can come up with some wonderful ideas about what we would like to track, but if we can't think of a tangible and feasible way of actually gathering that information, then it's not a good indicator. Um, especially when we're working at the grassroots level on smaller scale projects, we always have to think about what's feasible, what's going to be within our budget, and what's, what's actually going to be possible within the confines of the scope of the project. Is, is uh, connected to that, is it practical? Is it easy to collect and analyze the data? Is it gonna be affordable to do so? Does the indicator you've selected allow for disaggregation as needed? So depending on, um, and disaggregation means separating out uh, by beneficiary group. So depending on the focus or object, uh, 
um, goals of your program, you may want to be looking at female and male beneficiaries separately. You may want to be looking at adults and youth separately. Uh, you may want to look at um, you know, farmers versus entrepreneurs. There's many different ways of uh, breaking out your data that might be relevant to your particular community, your particular project. So make sure that your, your indicators allow you to break that out and your data collection allows for that. Um, can the, the indicator or data that you're, you're looking at be verified by any other means? So if you're going to do uh, have an indicator um, about uh, training, so people developing capacity, um, and how are you going to measure how people are learning new knowledge or skills and look at that in more than one way so that you're going to validate your, say you're going to do a, a post-training survey and see what people learned in the training. Is there another way for you to capture information to validate those results so that you can be confident uh, that that learning actually took place? Will the people collecting the data have the same understanding of the indicator as you as the designer of that indicator? So it should be so clear that there can be no room for, there's no room for error or misinterpretation, that everybody has a very good understanding of what the data is and what the data is gonna be used for. And finally, uh, a good tip, if you want to uh, benchmark uh, your progress against sort of the, the uh, what other projects or other groups have been able to achieve, you could look at the, whether your indicators could be aligned to, um, other projects that you've done in the past, other projects other groups are doing, or sort of national or global um, standard uh, data so that you can compare your progress in one community against sort of overall progress nationally. So these are some other considerations that I like to keep in mind when I'm thinking about developing indicators. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share about any other, is there anything I've missed or anything that they you like to to think about when you've developed indicators for past projects? Not seeing, but I just wanted to mention a question that's come up in the chat, which is just to clarify how you're using outcomes, outputs, and impacts in this case. So how the project builder considers outcome, output, and impact. Yeah. So, like, so the sorry, the question is, which wording are we using? I'm using them a bit interchangeably. <laughs> so, I think in the project builder, in the logic model, we talk about the ultimate outcome, the intermediate outcome, immediate outcomes, and outputs. Mm -hmm. All of those are different levels of impact, really, of the program, right? So, um, and when I say objective, I really mean your sort of your desired outcome. So what it is you're trying to achieve through the program. And that's gonna be broken down into different levels of, of change, right? So if you recall, those of you who are in the training around the project builder are those who have been using the logical, the logic model. You'll sort of remember that everything um, that's broken down from the bottom up, right? It's the impact, the inputs that you're going to put in, just generally expect as output as outputs, right? So you put in the input, you generate an output, which is the completion of an activity or the provision of goods or services or uh, access points to members of the community. Your immediate outcomes are your short-term change that's going, that is going to occur as a result of those outputs. Your intermediate level outcomes are your longer term change that are more about behavior and practice. So it's not just knowledge or capacity, but actual change in how people are living their lives. Uh, and then your ultimate outcome is that long term vision of what your project is contributing to. So your vision of what the, com the state of life should be for your uh, beneficiaries or community um, over the long term. I'm not sure who asked the question, but does that, does that answer if someone can? Yes, I think it does, thank you. That's okay, all right, great. Okay. So the next, uh, 
these here. So here's our little example. This is the same one that you saw on the previous slide sort of mapped out in that logic, uh, logic model and the beginnings of the uh, monitoring and evaluation and learning plan. So I'd like to look at this indicator and have you provide your feedback. What do you think of this indicator against the outcome of improved livelihoods among farmers in community X? The ind proposed indicator is the percentage total of the farmers with improved monthly incomes. What do you think about that indicator? Do you think it satisfies the considerations uh, for a strong indicator? You could put your thoughts into the chat box or if you'd like to, to speak, you're welcome to, uh, to unmute and share your thoughts there too. I think you probably need a definition of improved, uh, oh, you said livelihood. So you're just talking specifically about income? The indicator is. So do you think when you read uh, an outcome around livelihoods, I think that you're, you're touching on a good question there, uh, Christy. Do you think that measuring monthly income is the right choice? Is that an, uh, an appropriate indicator to measure livelihoods? I guess the social impact is what I was thinking of. So other elements of um, how people feel they're being successful in their lives. So livelihood could mean strictly financial, but I don't take it as such. So I think there's other elements that would need to be included to have a holistic perspective. Yeah, and I also be curious, the percentage of farmers, what if it's like 0.5%? Um, it's not is that acceptable or are we looking for a larger percentage? Is the, um, the metric which be fall within a large certain range or not? Mm -hmm. so, so generally the, um, where it says percentage of total, that total would be the total number of farmers participating in your project. So it probably would be a higher, I would hope it would be a higher percentage than 0.5. It might be only 0.5% of all the farmers in the community. But when it says percentage total, it would mean the 100 farmers, for example, that are participating in your project. Okay, so it could mean if you had a low percentage that your, um, your outcome was right, but you just didn't get the results you wanted. Exactly, yep. Okay. Anybody else? Any comments? Thoughts? I think uh, someone has mentioned in the chat that it's partly it can be measured, right? That's something it is measurable. Something that relatively easy to collect data on. But I think I think uh, to Christy's point, I think Christy's point is excellent that uh, it probably isn't the only indicator that you would want to use uh, to track against the SOCA. I generally um, hear a tip around disaggregation. Um, if you're working with Canadian funders and a lot of international uh, donors or, or partners, um, it's very common these days to break everything out by gender. So you'd be looking at female farmers versus male farmers to make sure that your, um, your project is equitable from a, a gender equality perspective in terms of the impact. Uh, I see Charles. Yeah, that's true. Good point, Charles. Uh, Charles has obviously worked in farming communities before, so um, that this indicator could be problematic as the only indicator because depending on what crops you're farming, um, you may uh, have harvests at different times and your income might be coming in, not necessarily evenly spread as monthly income. Uh, but as income that might come in a larger chunk after a harvest that you then live off for a while. So monthly might be problematic. Good considerations. The other thing um, that I've thought of, that I thought of about this one um, is what per, what percentage increase is going to be acceptable. So if you if you're only looking at data that says income has increased, what if it only increased by the equivalent of $1? But 100% but of farmers in got a $1 monthly income increase. The data would say the project was a huge success because you achieved 100% of farmers achieved that impact. But would that project really be successful? 
would you have achieved real change? You wouldn't have uh, achieved real, real change because I think in that case, in that case, um, you have also to consider the lifestyle change or what the increase in income has led to, you know. So that is what you're measuring. Otherwise, just the increase of income, the $1 increase will not be enough to, to, to indicate that uh, there's uh, uh, an increase. I mean, there's uh, uh, the, the achievement has been met. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good point. And Dave here asks another good question is um, perhaps asking the farmers themselves what improved livelihoods would look like and allowing that to inform the development of the indicator, accepting it might not be about income. It might be about how much food they're able to provide. It might be about uh, school fees, which they can't afford now that they can afford uh, as a result of improved income. There could be other measures as well. Excellent. So we're going to carry through that uh, that case study. I obviously I, I I won't be able to integrate all of these uh, comments as we go through because um, we made this yes this part yesterday. But um, we'll we'll continue to talk about this and how that rolls through with targets and all the other elements of the plan. Okay. And one final comment, which was that it assumes the income from farming is the only income, so there could have been that came from something outside of your profit, so you have to be able to measure for that. That's true, that's an excellent point. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are different types of indicators, and this goes to the question that was asked about um, what we mean by outcomes and the different levels of outcomes. So your indicators are going to be a look different depending on whether they're which kind of outcome that they're connected to. So an indicator that is connected to an intermediate outcome is going to be measured in terms of uh, change in practice. So this is a behavior level change um, and the indicator needs to be measuring that change in how people are behaving, uh, their, their practice, how they're living their lives at that level of impact. An immediate level outcome indicator is generally looking at knowledge or capacity or skills. Um, so it's around um, learning um, and what people know and have the capacity for. Um, sometimes it's about access um, and the indicator needs to measure those accordingly. Um, so projects, that, projects can have very different uh, objectives and intended outcomes depending on the sector they're targeting um, and what's outlined in the theory of change. And, I think I didn't save something I added there. So I wanted to give an example of this. So um, clean water, as an example. Clean water could be an input that is a path to many different outcomes. They're all positive in a community. But depending on the organization that is implementing the clean water program, they might be uh, do, uh, providing clean water access for different reasons, right? And their indicators around the impact of that clean water are going to look very different depending on their objective. For example, um, uh, organization that is focused on uh, education might be bringing clean water to a community in order to facilitate female students in attending school more consistently. In a, in a place where female, where girls are responsible for water uh, collection and they're having to travel a great distance to gather water for the family, that might keep them out of school. So a clean water project could be evaluated on the basis of did it impact the girl child and allow girls to attend school more consistently. A clean water project being implemented by a health focused uh, organization would be looking potentially at reduced incidence of waterborne diseases amongst children, right? Uh, a clean water project that is about, um, that maybe is looking at climate adaptation might be bringing in water for the purpose of irrigation and soil improvement and growing food. So the same input or the same uh, output uh, sorry, the, at the, in the logic model, the same output of clean water uh, point developed might be measured differently at the immediate and intermediate outcome 
depending on the lens that you're looking at that project. That makes sense? Those of you who are on camera, you can nod or <laughs> trying to just get us out here. Okay, so, so your choice of indicators, you know, with all of those tangible, okay, thanks Kwame, um, all those tangible questions we're asking about choosing the right indicator, it also should be an indicator that's going to tell the right story for your group, for your project, for your theory of change, for your stakeholders, right? About what, the, why you've undertaken this work. Uh, can I ask, just based on the comment that was in chat, Dave, is that Dave? Is that Dave, Dave? Where's Dave? Is that board member Dave? It's Dave, Dave. Yep. Aha, you're hiding. Dave, I don't hide. hide. <laughs> so, so just uh, for everybody who hasn't met Dave, he doesn't have his video on, but Dave actually worked for a long time as a monitoring and evaluation consultant, uh, working on large scale uh, international projects. So he's hiding here, but listen to the things he, he has to say, because he's got a ton of experience uh, in doing this. Um, and he's a fantastic asset. Um, I have learned a lot from him over the years uh, on this stuff. So. Dave, keep the, t the comments coming. <laughs> okay. Um, the semantics of indicators. Um, there are uh, very like sp uh, specific, I guess, ways of wording indicators. Uh, if you're working with a large scale funder, you might find that that funder has a uh, particular requirement about how you structure indicators. Generally speaking, though, what you're going to want to do is to be specific about um, who is being impacted and what the change the change that they're uh, they're uh, experiencing. Generally, it's expressed as a number slash total or percentage total. The total being of the total uh, beneficiaries in the project, the total number of people that you are targeting uh, through your project activities. Um, so an example here, oh, it, it, you know, being a percentage total of women accessing adequate health counseling. Um, this is an example of an indicator that is very specific, uh, but it includes a qualifier um, that we would like to, that you would want to try to avoid when you're developing your indicator language. Um, qualifiers are value statements that can be very, very difficult to measure. So in this uh, indicator, uh, we're talking about adequate health counseling. And that word adequate is going to cause problems because how would that be defined? How would you measure something that is so subjective in that case? Um, so generally, we would, you would want to try to avoid putting in um, those kinds of value statements around uh, the change or the, uh, the input or um, experience of your beneficiaries. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So now that we've got a sense of how to develop indicators. The next step is going to be to develop targets. So you've got your indicator, you know what you're going to measure, um, but you need also to uh, set a goal for what it is you're trying to achieve so that you can assess along the way whether you're making enough progress against those indicators. So good question to start from is what would you consider to be a success, right? So if you're using the example of training farmers, um, how many farmers having improved livelihoods would make for a successful project? If you're working with 100 farmers, how many of them should achieve that level of impact for you to feel like, yes, we did a really good job on this? What would your target beneficiaries consider to be a success? So what, how many, uh, what kinds of change are they going to say, yes, this happened and this project was worthwhile. It was worth participating and engaging with this organization? What do your other stakeholders in the community consider to be a success? What is achievable or realistic uh, given, the given the scope and timeframe of your project? 
you know, keeping in mind. So if you're working with a small budget or you're working on a short term sort of one year kind of intervention, the level of change you're going to be able to achieve in that short timeline, um, you know, needs to be reasonable and recognize that change does take time, right? And what you achieve in one year is going to look very different from what you would achieve if you were carrying on for five years. What is the relationship between your output targets and your higher level targets? And we're going to look at an example of that uh, in a second. Um, so monitoring progress against targets is all about analysis and learning. It's not about, uh, you know, falling short and then feeling like you're failed. No, falling short of a target might mean that you've set the wrong target. It might mean you're looking at the wrong indicator, and it might mean that something needs to be improved. So something about the approach isn't working, um, and something you need to make a change to the project in order to achieve your targets. Just means that something's not going as expected, and that is really important information to know. because so you wouldn't want to continue on and finish a project and miss the opportunity of maximizing results and, and impacting. so it's an opportunity for learning and for course correction on the last slide here i mentioned that uh you want to think about the relationship between your outputs and your output uh, targets and here's an example here so using this example of an indicator looking at the impact on uh farmers you see here that I, I did add the disaggregation, um, added a statement around of uh, how much uh, incomes would have improved. But the point here is to look at your total. So at the output level, you've got 100 farmers completing training, okay? That 100 becomes the total that your other indicators are expressed against. So you have then a target at the, say, at the immediate outcome level that you say, of those 100 farmers that we're going to change, 90 of them are actually going to have learned these new, this new knowledge and skills. They're actually going to have um, improved skills for agroecology. So this level, this target reflects the reality that not everyone who receives training is going to be able to process it, going to be able to retain that information uh, and internalize it after receiving training. At the next level of impact, which is those actually improving their livelihoods as a result of agroecology, um, reflects the reality that not everyone with new skills is actually going to follow through, put those new skills to work successfully, right? So at each level, you'll see the target gets a little bit lower, right? So there's always, you're always gonna to have to assume that there's gonna be drop off in, in achievement. Some people will get the impact of receiving training. Some people will get the impact of receiving training and actually internalizing that new knowledge, the new skills. Some, a smaller group of people are gonna be able to translate that into practice and, uh, and experience change at that level within the scope of the project. That makes sense? Yeah. And of course, these numbers are arbitrary. I'm not suggesting that 90 is the right, 90% of people trained is the right target. Really depends on your starting point, really depends on the community, it really depends on the content you're trying uh, uh, to impart, right? So those targets will really need to be um, personalized to each project and each group of stakeholders. And the other, um, and just a sort of a comment on this, and Dave, feel free to weigh in if you've got some, some uh, wisdom to share here, is I think there, when you're talking about um, developing a monitoring and evaluation plan that is going to be submitted to a funder, I think there it can be a tendency to kind of overpromise of what, what is going to happen and the number of people who are gonna be impacted and how successful it's gonna be. Um, and I think that can, that's a dangerous uh, mistake. I think what you want to do is set realistic targets of success that you are going to be able to measure your progress against. If you set targets that are too high, it's going it's, um, it's to make it difficult for you to evaluate whether you've actually been successful because maybe 70% of people trained um, retaining that knowledge is going to be a huge achievement in your context. 
and you want to set that target as 70%. If you're always looking at 90%, 70% is always going to feel like you're falling short and you could end up spending a lot of time and energy trying to figure out why or course correct when really course correction isn't the issue, that that is in fact the achievement um, and a good goal to have stri strived for. I, I can quickly, there's like two quick thoughts I put in the chat. Uh, Basing targets on your past performance, if your program has been going, is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. If you've got another program that does something similar, making reference to that for your target, another great option. And finally, um, it, transparency is, is the top, but I think it's reasonable. And if you, have, if you communicate to a funder appropriately, adjusting targets is appropriate if circumstances are you know allow for it so changing a target because oh we're actually doing much better so let's actually push the target up or what we set as a target is really inappropriate we need to change it as long as you clearly communicated that it can be appropriate to adjust your targets but you have to justify and communicate that as you're going those are my quick thoughts <laughs> that's helpful thank you dave so the other question to ask yourself, once you've got your um, indicators and your targets set, is what could you be missing, right? Um, a good monitoring and evaluation and learning plan doesn't just ask, uh, seek to measure progress against the results you've already decided you're gonna achieve or you're striving to achieve. It also includes strategies to capture unanticipated experiences and impacts. Right? Recognizing that, of course, what you've got in your logic model is essentially, or, or your theory of change is a hypothesis. It's what you think is going to happen, right? That doesn't mean that's what's going to happen, or there might be other things um, that take place that you haven't uh, thought of in advance. So you're gonna wanna think about how to complement um, the uh, data that you're gathering against specific indicators, complement them with some qualitative uh, data as well. Um, so qualitative data is important because it helps to support data validation. Um, it can be used to, um, to provide context or nuance that can help you to understand the results you're seeing through your quantitative data. Uh, for example, you may have uh, on this, uh, the one with household, uh, sorry, uh, farmer livelihoods, you might be surveying farmers on, say, a quarterly basis to find out what their current average monthly income is. You may want to interview some of those farmers or do a focus group where you're talking to them so that you can understand what does that change in income mean? For their household. You could capture farmers saying, well, I haven't really improved my income that much, but it's had been very helpful because it's allowed us to do these, uh, you know, X, Y, or Z. So it provides that the information that helps round out your understanding of what the numbers are saying, could also echo and validate what the numbers are saying, or in a strange situation, you might get one thing in the numbers, and when you actually talk to people, you hear something very different. Um, and that's going to be important to capture as well. Um, keeping in mind that we're all human, right? And so just as we have interests as stakeholders in our projects, just as funders have stakeholders, beneficiaries also as stakeholders in the project have interests and they are also going to be uh, influenced by, um, by their own perception of the project. And you can run the risk of having data that's not accurate uh, depending on the state of your relationship with those beneficiaries, on how much they've been integrated into the process, how much they understand why you're asking the questions, right? So it's important to have um, opportunities for data validation. It also provides opportunity for this deeper analysis uh, and learning, because if you're say, falling short of a target, you're gonna need to talk to your stakeholders to find out why, right? The, the numbers will tell you you're falling short, but in order to understand what you need to do differently, or even if something needs to be uh, changed, you need to have input from the stakeholders that are involved in that aspect of the project. 
It also allows you to identify outliers or unanticipated uh, results of the program, both positive and negative, that you may want to start tracking or start thinking about um, as you proceed uh, with project implementation. And then it can also help to uh, it can also help you in your communications uh, around the project. Um, and I don't just mean reporting to funders and donors, although that is helpful to have those kind of case studies and stories that help uh, tell, uh, paint the picture of what's happening. Um, but it's also important for uh, sharing information internally within your organization and without, within all the stakeholders that are involved in the project. Um, it's not just funders and donors that respond to human to human uh, impact, right, and to human stories about change. We all internalize that in a different way than we do when we're looking at charts and graphs. So having that kind of qualitative information that you can use uh, to really help people understand what's happening is going to be useful uh, in all of your communications around the work you're doing. Can I just ask a couple of questions at this point because I think they fit well with this section yeah. that I've received. So one is about um, measuring what the person has called non-tangible results. So say you're doing something like running a psychosocial support uh, workshop um, or something of that nature, would the qualitative um, data gathering be the best way to measure this or how do you monitor and measure the success of non-tangible results um, and I'm meaning more sort of social change um, and then the second question is how does one measure monitoring and evaluation if an activity is interrupted by an unforeseen um, crisis or situation yep. COVID-19 and the time gap that interrupts it um, I just asked this here because you're talking about um, you know accounting for unexpected results um, I think those are both excellent questions. Um, let me start with the second one, if you don't mind, uh, around uh, you know crises. Absolutely, when something as significant as say COVID nineteen uh, takes place during your project, that's going to throw everything um, into question, right? So I think um, as uh, you know, in terms of program project management, not just on your monitoring and evaluation, but you're going to want to take a step back and think about all the potential uh, impacts that COVID-19 could be having on the implementation of your activities and the achievement of your results. You're going to want to make sure that those conversations include as many stakeholders as possible, right? So that shouldn't be done uh, sitting in your office necessarily, but it should be done by seeking input and, and um, ideas uh, fears even or concerns um, from your project beneficiaries um, and other stakeholders in the community so that you can be prepared for what might happen, the impacts that might happen. Um, when you are monitoring, um, you, you're co collecting data and you're, you're analyzing sort of your progress, knowing that COVID-19 had has potentially impacted those results, that's where this kind of qualitative uh, data gathering is going to be really, really crucial because you're going to need to ask people and get input from the people experiencing the change as to how much of what you're looking at is COVID-19 related and what could actually be something else that's gone wrong in the project or could be strengthened in the project. It's going to help you to understand what you need to do differently, right? So it's possible, you know, I think it would also be a mistake um, or you miss opportunities if you make the assumption that the elephant in the room being COVID-19 is the thing that has impacted the program. It might not have been, right? Something else might be uh, happening in the community or just because COVID happened doesn't mean your training was a good training, right? So the, you could have a, um, missed your targets and say, oh, well, it was COVID, but in fact, it's because your training module wasn't effective, right? So you got to be able to ask these questions and get the feedback from the people experiencing the project um, uh, from all perspectives, not just from the perspective of the, the group or the individuals delivering the project. On, on the second question for the, uh, you know, psychosocial impacts, 
I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a scenario that lends itself really well to qualitative um, data collection um, and, you know, open-ended uh, kinds of research where you're allowing the beneficiary to tell you what's most important to them and what their experience has been. There are also tools out there that you can use um, that can attempt to quantify uh, that kind of experience and change uh, in psycho in a psychosocial um, uh, uh, manner. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, something called uh, knowledge attitudes and practices surveys, um, which are basically uh, surveys or questionnaires, but that are not just about the right answer, but are around uh, where you can probe people's sort of thoughts and attitudes and feelings about things by asking them to respond to questions um, and how much things resonate with them. It's a really, in, it's really interesting that, you know, you have to be very careful about how they're set up. Um, they need to definitely be, um, there's definitely no one size fits all. They have to be very rooted in the culture, uh, the language nuance, um, the specific context of where your project has taken place. But when they're executed well, I think they can be really helpful. In, in this case, I'm saying as a quantitative way of trying to validate your qualitative uh, results. So the qualitative might be your primary uh, source of information, but you could use a tool like that to provide some quantitative data that, may, that would ideally sort of validate what you're hearing in your focus groups or interviews or um, work with individuals. So. Mm -hmm. And a question, what do you think about participatory research for these applications? Um, thumbs up to that, Christy. Yes. <laughs> the more, uh, as I said, you know, the more um, participatory uh, your data collection and, and research is, the, the better quality I think it's going to be, right? Um, the more, uh, we're going to talk about that uh, on a slide in, in a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, the more that the, the, it's a team effort where the stakeholders involved in the project at all levels are integrated into your monitoring and evaluation process throughout the process, uh, the better. Because when people understand why they're being asked for this information, um, they're going to provide the best quality information that they can because they're going to understand that it's about them, right? That it's about learning so that the project can be the best experience for them that it could possibly be. So it's not something that they're being asked to do that's benefiting someone else somewhere, somewhere else, but rather it's something that they're spending time and energy on because it's ultimately going to benefit them and make sure that their, uh, their experience is as positive as possible. Um, it also means that you're going to avoid um, you're, you avoid power dynamics or um, the perception that people themselves are being judged or evaluated in some way, which can lead to um, skewed data or inaccurate data being reported. Um, by which I mean, so, you know, if, if a project beneficiary thinks that you're, you know, evaluating them, and their performance and in some way that might impact whether they get to participate in the future or you're going to choose them to be part of the next round of trainings or whatever they're going to be uh uh if that's going to motivate them to give you the answers they think you want to hear as opposed to giving you the answers that are accurate and really reflect their experience so that you can learn from that right um, and by having, uh, you know, using participatory methods where it's not necessarily an outsider coming in um, and collecting data and then leaving with that data, but that it's members uh, and stakeholders that are local in that community who are participating in the data gathering, again, it's going to mean that you're, um, you're going to achieve a level of understanding and um, sort of you know, that we're in this, we're collaborating and we're in this together and we're doing this so that we can all do better. Um, and that's going to mean that you get better data and you can learn more and you can achieve more. Thank you. And hello, Laurent. 
Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Claire and uh, Katie. Um, just to chip in on the uh, qualitative data and uh, quantitative, um, uh, I just remember that we used to use um, kind of a risk log frame when we are designing a project, and that that. to allow those who are implemented what risks they might go through. Mm -hmm. uh, they could be political change or environmental change or any unforeseen circumstances that uh, tool will allow them to follow while implementing the project, which information or what might happen, like in the case of COVID-19. And the other one is the initial uh, um, Mission, which is kind of a mission that allow uh, project implementers to define the targets based on the information they would get before the beginning of the project, then they will set the targets. Then based on the review, could be a mid-term review that will allow them as well to know how far they have gone with uh, quantity or quality of uh, the different data they are gathering and to make sure that when they are implementing activities seen from the side of uh, uh, indicators to make sure that indicators they are choosing they are realistic and they are visible seen under that angle that will allow them as well to collect qualitative and quantitative data that will be used against the initial review before the beginning of the project. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laurent. That's helpful. Thank you for sharing.